hello again, everybody. I meant to discuss Leopard Syndrome at the end of the Noonan Syndrome section, uh, but uh, I must have omitted uh, to put that in the slides, so uh, I'm just going to talk about it very briefly here. Uh, Leopard Syndrome shares a lot in common with Noonan Syndrome. It's considered a Noonan-like syndrome, and that's due to the fact that this is a uh, this is a, has a mutation on the same exact gene as Noonan syndrome does. Why exactly uh, there's Noonan syndrome in some patients and then you get this leopard syndrome in some patients, I don't know, but it probably has something to do with the exact mutation and where it's at. So uh, it's a mutation of the PTPN11 and it's frequently referred to as Noonan syndrome with multiple lentigenes or it could be referred to as uh, multiple lentigene syndrome. Uh, but the uh, referring to it as Noonan syndrome with multiple lentigenes, that seems to be uh, what the preferred uh, the, the preferred name is, and it really is accurate because it reflects a similar etiology and also a similar uh, symptomatic profile, similar features uh, that you see in these patients when you look at them in comparison to Noonan's patients. This is relatively rare. Uh, epidemiologic data is not available, but it is considered to be much more rare than Noonan syndrome. And a small study has demonstrated a slight preponderance in men, but that was only one study and it was pretty small. So you can see the most prominent symptom here in this patient is these lentigenes. And lentigenes are these small irregular brown polygonal macules and they tend to develop as the patient gets older. So babies may be born with leopard syndrome, but you're not going to notice the lentigenes, and the lentigenes are a necessary feature in order to diag diagnose leopard syndrome. So if they don't have lentigenes, they don't have leopard syndrome. Now they will develop these, typically they start to come on during late childhood, uh, maybe even earlier, but they really uh, they really begin to uh, become prominent uh, as as the uh, as the child uh, transitions into adulthood, and they're not responsive to sun. So if if the person goes out and gets a suntan, they're not going to get darker. So these are small irregular brown polygonal macules. They're about two to five millimeters in diameter and they do darken with age. So you develop more as you get older and they begin to darken as well. And they're found most prominently on the face, neck, and upper trunk, which causes problems for these patients because some of them have a lot. Um, other things that you can see, and uh, leopard syndrome, the, where we get this name from, I think it was named in the 1950s or 1960s, it's actually not named after somebody, and that's why it's all in uppercase. It's actually a, an acronym for the syndromes, uh, the, or the symptoms that you see in this syndrome. So the L stands for lentigenes, then the E stands for EKG, or echocardiographic anomalies. So some of the things that you can see here are left axis deviation, you can see a PR prolongation, or you can see a right bundle branch block. Uh, similar to in Noonan syndrome, you can get pul uh, pulmonary valvular stenosis. That's actually uh, pulmonary valve stenosis is actually the most common uh, uh, structural heart defect in leopard syndrome, just like in Noonan syndrome. And just like in Noonan's, you can also see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Another feature that's seen similar to Noonan syndrome is ocular hypertellurism. You can also see pulmonary stenosis, abnormalities of genitalia, again, just like Noonan syndrome, retardation of growth, which is just short stature, again, seen in Noonan syndrome, and then some of these patients, about a quarter of them will have some level of sensory neural deafness. And again, the facial features are similar to those that are seen in Noonan syndrome, so that triangular face, the high anterior hairline, low posterior hairline, uh, and so forth. So here's an example of a child with leopard syndrome. And so what you note here is one, uh, kind of hard to see, but pulled back his hair, you would, uh, you'd be able to see that he has a, a pretty high anterior hairline. Uh, but what you also notice is this sort of triangular face shape. And that's due uh, not only to a little bit, uh, he's got a little bit of a wider head, uh, but he's also got this very pointy jaw. Uh, and as he gets older, these, uh, some of these features are going to become a little bit more prominent. Uh, first, the lentigenes are going to become more prominent. He's going to get more as he gets older, uh, but the, the hypertellurism may become a little more prominent. It's a little, he's a little bit hypertelleric right now, but, uh, but it's 
sometimes a little bit difficult to notice that on, uh, on younger children. So here's a, uh, a woman with uh, leopard syndrome, and you can see she's got a lot more lentigines here. Uh, she also has a little bit of hypertellurism, but what you really notice is that pointy jaw. And also note the, uh, the high anterior hairline here. You see this, again, you see this in Noonan syndrome. Uh, so it's not specific to leopard syndrome. Remember, when you're diagnosing leopard syndrome, it's these lentigines that are central to the diagnosis. It's basically just like somebody who's got Noonan syndrome, but they've got these lentigines too. So these lentigines aren't restricted to the skin. They can also, uh, they can also show up on the eye as well. You can see here's a, a lot. And like I said, they, they predominate on the face and the neck and the upper torso. And they can actually get to be so many where they start to homogenize. So the clinical diagnostic criteria, uh, generally this is a clinical diagnosis, uh, but you can and usually are encouraged to confirm this uh, with, a, uh, with genetic testing. Uh, just because uh, there's genetic components to this and, uh, and there's implications and so you'll want to confirm the diagnosis. But for the most part, this diagnosis can be suspected clinically because of all the stereotypic features that are seen. So first off, multiple lentigines need to be present. That's a must. If they don't have that, then they don't have leopard syndrome. They might have Noonan syndrome, but they don't have leopard syndrome if they don't have these lentigines. Um, then in addition to the lentigines, they need to have at least two of the following features. So cardiac or structural abnormalities, genital urinary abnormalities, and that could be something like hypospadias, endocrine abnormalities, neurologic deficits, particularly seizures, cephalofacial dysmorphism, and that would be any of those faces uh, that you would see in Noonan syndrome, like the hypertellurism or the pointy jaw or the high anterior hairline, short stature, and then skeletal abnormalities. So to work the patient up for leopard syndrome, uh, and you would, it, it would be advisable to work the patient up, a uh, patient with short stature and multiple lentigines, because right there you already have the short stature is pushing you towards a diagnosis of Noonan syndrome, possibly leopard syndrome if they have the lentigines. Uh, then you're going to want to get uh, further testing to confirm that diagnosis because you need at least one more uh, of those uh, of those criteria. So you'll consult cardiology for testing. You're going to get both an EKG and an echocardiogram, and that's both going to be important for confirming your diagnosis vis-a-vis uh, -vis the criteria, but also to look for any possible uh, subclinical structural heart abnormality that may uh, warrant further investigation. You also consult endocrinology for testing. They'll need an audiometric evaluation because of the preponderance of, uh, of, of deafness in these patients or hearing uh, disabilities. A uh, renal sonogram is going to be important. That will fall under the genital urinary abnormalities if they have that. Uh, they can have duplication of the kidney. Uh, they can have a uh, horseshoe kidney. They can have an absent kidney. Uh, you'll refer them to an orthopedist for a skeletal assessment. And then uh, these are children, particularly, uh, you'll want them to have a developmental assessment by a developmental pediatrician. The management for leopard syndrome is very similar to Noonan syndrome in as much as it's symptomatic. Uh, the difference here is that we have lentigines, and so how do we manage these? Uh, it's pretty difficult, uh, but we try to use skin lightening agents to lighten up the lentigines and make them a little bit uh, less noticeable. So you can use these skin lightening agents. Topical tretinoin or hydroquinone are useful. Uh, however, if this is unsuccessful, uh, then you can refer the patient off to a surgeon for cosmetic surgery. Uh, so if, and this is the reason you're sending them off to, uh, to get echocardiogram, uh, if they do have an outflow tract obstruction, then you can use beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Of course, this should be done under the supervision of a cardiologist. These patients also, if they have an outflow tract obstruction, they're going to require avoiding strenuous activity because remember, you hear about this all the time, these previously healthy athletes that suddenly die uh, of, uh, of heart failure or uh, an arrhythmia 
uh, on the middle of the basketball court and they're maybe 19 or 20 years old and it's like what went wrong and usually it is uh, something like this hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and patients with Noonan syndrome or Leopard syndrome are at risk for that. Uh, so if they are found to have uh, an outflow tract obstruction uh, then they should avoid strenuous activity. And genetic counseling will also be useful for these patients um, as well.